Our guest today is uh, Dr. Uh, Ginger Campbell. Uh, Dr. Campbell is a physician, author, and podcaster who has practiced uh, emergency medicine and palliative care for over two decades. Uh, but her wide interest led her to become one of the uh, earlier and one of the most consistent uh, podcast uh, podcasters uh, uh, in in the podcasting world. And today she hosts uh, multiple podcasts. The first uh, having launched in two thousand six. Uh, so we have a lot to learn from her deep and varied experience in podcast interviewing over the years. Ginger, uh, welcome to the Craft Podcast. Thanks for having me. So for those who don't know, uh, how would you introduce uh, your podcast, Ginger? Uh, my big show is Brain Science, and I, I call it the show for everyone who has a brain, which is supposed to communicate the idea that it's doesn't matter what your background is. It's a show for people of all backgrounds. And the theme is exploring how recent discoveries in neuroscience are unraveling the mystery of how our brain makes us human. Wonderful. And uh, we'll get into um, more about uh, the Brain Science Podcast and uh, uh, your other work uh, in podcasting. Um, but, um, you know, suffice it to say, it's, you know, one of the, uh, for me, it's been one of my favorite uh, podcasts generally, and particularly in, um, in, uh, the area of brain science. Um, uh, and, uh, so that, you know, that makes me really excited to uh, speak with you today, but in particular, uh, I'd like to start off to just ask about how, uh, you got into, um, podcasting, but not from your starting point in podcasting very early on, were there some signs or signals that uh, young Virginia was going to be uh, into uh, media uh, later on in her life? Well, you know, at first, when I was thinking about that question, my answer was no. But then I realized that, well, I've always I was always an aspiring writer. So before I got into podcasting, I, I did a lot of writing. I wrote one book that was unpublished and several other nonfiction books that, I, that got to the proposal level, but but never made it to the book um level so when podcasting appeared in itunes uh in july of 2005 i was like that is that's it i just knew that i wanted to do it i had tried a little blogging i didn't really like blogging i don't read blogs because nobody edits them <laughs> and they're long-winded and nobody gets to the point but at any rate um but i loved podcasting from the start and uh, i just knew it just turned out to be the right medium for me that's uh, that's great, but I would imagine there's some, I guess, deeper motivation because a lot of people, you know, they're uh, have have interests in uh, different areas, but they don't have the the desire, the motivation to go and and do something about it. And I wonder if you could speak to, I guess, where where that came from in, in you to want to express either through uh, writing. Uh, or later on through, I guess, uh, spoken media? Well, I guess it it was partly um, a professional habit, okay, because I, as a physician, I explain uh, medicine to people day in, day out. I think I'm pretty good at making it into English, which a lot of physicians are not. They, they talk medical, and people never know what they're saying. Um, and I've always been really interested in translating, you know, what, you know, my medical knowledge into something regular people could understand. And I will tell you a little bit of the, about the origins of brain science because I think it, it sheds light on your question. Before I actually launched brain science, I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. In fact, I went about a year before, you know, from the, the, my initial discovery of brain science to my decision, I mean, sorry, my initial discovery of podcasting to my decision to launch what was originally called the Brain Science Podcast. And what happened was I was listening to another podcast out of Australia called The Sci-Fi Show, it was about the intersection between science fiction and philosophy. And back then, you know, discussion boards were real popular. It was before Facebook and those kinds of sites. And so I was on his site and people kept talking about the brain and they kept saying stuff that was wrong. And I would say, well, you know, if you would read X, you would know why and blah. And I kept saying that. And finally, he says to me, well, why don't you just record a book review for my show? And that doing that was what actually became episode two of Brain Science. But once I recorded that, I mean, I was so jazzed. I don't know if you remember that feeling when you do your first recording. Um, it's just a real adrenaline rush. And if you don't feel that when you record, then forget about podcasting. 
right? Because <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, and and as soon as I recorded that, and that was a very short piece, I realized that I would never run out of material because, and this was 2006, so it was before neuroscience was as hot as it is now. But even then, I could see that I had a subject that you know would be endlessly fascinating, which I think is really important if you are going to have a long-running show. You need to have a topic that can maintain your passion for a long time. Yeah, that's a really uh, powerful anecdote. Um, thanks for sharing that. Were there were there other things that you tried that didn't work out? I guess you mentioned blogging uh, and uh, writing something that, that wasn't published before. Um, but I guess to maybe just to, to uh, I don't know if this is putting words in your mouth, but when you did that book review and recording, you felt like that, that, that was it. Like you'd found something that, uh, you could be passionate about doing for a long period of time. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't really see it that way at the time, but what I did see was that, you know, I put a lot of work into that very short bit, but it was, like I said, it was a, a, an adrenaline rush, and writing was never like that. Writing was always just work. Right. So now, you know, I put a lot of preparation, you know, into interviewing, and well, I know we're going to talk about that later, but the payoff is when I do the interview. The interview is so much fun. Yeah. And, and of course, at that time, I had not even done an interview. I'm just talking about for me now. Um, you know, I put all this prep time in, and then when I get a good interview, that's that's the reward for me. Right. That's great. So the uh, you did the that sci-fi um, book review. How did you get to the the point where you said, well, I'm, I'm going to make this, uh, a podcast and it's, it's going to be a show and you know, that there's probably a lot of planning and preparation that had mm -hmm. to come to make that, uh, to, to make that decision. Right. So again, it was 2006. So the tools that we had were much less than what we have now. So I spent like six months just trying to figure out how I was going to host my files and how I was going to set up my website and, and that kind of stuff that's really, you know, almost, almost easy now. And you had to do everything yourself. You know, you, you had to do all your own audio editing. There weren't all these guys out there, you know, offering to edit for you. Um, so there was a lot of prep involved. It took me about six months from when I realized that that was the topic I was going to do to when I launched. And I actually launched two shows at the same time in December of 2006, the other show was called Books and Ideas. And it was, I didn't want to be tied down to talking about neuroscience. You know, I wanted to be able to talk about other things. And, and so it was kind of my, my, um, my outlet for everything that didn't fit on brain science. And over the years, I have had a wide variety of guests on that show, ranging from Nobel Prize winning physicists to science fiction writers. Um, so that's always been my sort of, you know, show for fun. And it's, it's kind of, I don't know if it's officially pod faded. I haven't put it out. I put it on hiatus and nobody seemed to care. And that was the, you know, that was kind of information. Um, but I've had, you know, a lot of really good interviews on that show too. In fact, the very first interview I ever recorded was not for brain science. It was for books and ideas. And what was, what was the, 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 the cadence? Because that sounds like, I mean, so much effort to get that started. I even today starting this podcast uh, took uh, a, a bit of research, but there are so many levels of infrastructure that I didn't have to think about it. Right? I saw you know it's hosting on on Anchor. I I did the distribution myself just so you know I could control the RSS feed. But um, it's so it's, I imagine so uh, much easier. Um, so you put in. Um, all that effort and, and got it started. How did you decide the, the, the frequency that you wanted to do this? Um, and the, I guess the level of uh, effort, um, that, that yeah. you were going to commit. So initially what I tried to do was to put the shows out on alternating weeks. I never tried to put it, them both out every week. Um, it wasn't such a strong, you must have a weekly show ethic back then as it is now. And I still, which I really, 
disagree with. I think it's more important to be regular and let your listeners know what your schedule is. But um, I learned right away that I couldn't keep up that schedule. So what I landed on within a short time, within a couple of months, was to put books, uh, brain science out every other week. And then I put books and ideas out about, about once a month um, for the first um, few years. And then after a couple of years of doing brain science, one of my listeners said to me, you know, you, I was, I mean, I was busting it to do that. I mean, that was like a full second job. Okay. And finally, one of my, li- I met a listener in, I was in DC and I'm a listener, I met a listener for dinner. And he said to me, you know, you can put your show out once a month. And my initial reaction was, well, that's a really bad idea. But then I started thinking about the fact that my listeners were having trouble keeping up because of the nature of the show. A lot of people listen to episodes repeatedly, so right. they don't necessarily um, need an episode every week. And so I went to once a month, and that's kind of the schedule I've followed most of the time. Last year, I experimented with going back to twice a month and decided that that was you know, I thought I would get more advertisers, to be honest. And it turned out the advertisers I had were happy with once a month. And so um, I went back to once a month. Um, And Books and Ideas has always been sort of intermittent, although in 2019, I worked really hard to put it out every single month. Didn't help my numbers. I realized that it just uh, isn't enough of a niche. It's too general. Um, And I was already doing, at that time now, Grain Rainbows too. And so at one point, I was putting out three shows a month, or actually four episodes a month. Um, two brain science, one books and ideas, and one um, um, grain rainbows, or different combinations of those. And that was just too much for me because I've got, you know, a regular job. Right. And so now I'm just putting out two shows a month, one brain science and one um, grain rainbows. I think it's really important to pick a schedule that you can keep. And that depends on what the rest of your life looks like. Um, and you know, do you need to sleep? I'm kind of a big fan of sleeping. Rob Walsh always claims he just doesn't sleep and that's his um, solution, but I don't necessarily recommend that as the healthiest approach, especially for the long term. <laughs> um, I think that probably when you first start out having episodes more often is important because you you're trying to build your audience and you need to get some, you know, some material out there that people can see and know that you're regular. But once you've got, a year under your belt, I think you, that you can safely go to whatever schedule works for you. Right. That's my, my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for sharing that, that, that journey. Um, yeah, the, I, I've, I've gotten uh, mixed advice. Some, some folks uh, have been pretty adamant about the weekly, uh, the weekly uh, mandate. Um, but I figure, you know, uh, it sounds like uh, biweekly or monthly uh, is better than getting, you know, stressed, overwhelmed, and doing nothing at all, or uh, uh, or very irregular. I also want to, to to say this other thing is I used to have a show that I really liked a lot that came out every ten days. That was a weird frequency, but um, I would always be looking forward to it. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, let's face it: if you like podcasts, you get behind really fast right. on the ones you like. Right? So it's it's. Actually, if you listen to more than one show, hard to keep up with shows that come out every week. Now, if you are a fan cast talking about a TV show, then obviously every week is going to make sense, at least during the season of the TV show. Um, And I think that that is actually one of the origins of that idea, because a lot of the early podcasts were were fan casts. One of the first shows I listened to was called The Signal, and it was a show um, about Firefly, the TV show Firefly, Mm -hmm. which became the movie Serenity, a Joss Whedon show. And... um, um, so it made sense for it to be a weekly show, and a lot of the early podcasts were like that, and a lot of the popular um, independent podcasts now are, are fan casts, and so you can follow that schedule. And it also depends on how evergreen your content is. Right. You know, obviously, the the woman who's following Congress has got to put her show out, you know, really frequent because um, – um, I'm talking about the congressional dish um, – because things are constantly changing. So if you are a tech show or you are kind of show that's keeping up with current events, then you don't have any choice. But if you are creating evergreen content, um, then, then you have more flexibility. Right. And most of the shows out here, you know, most, a lot, there's a lot of business podcasts that are about how to succeed at XYZ. That kind of content doesn't have to be tied to the, to the weekly, um, get it those are the very people who seem most devoted to the concept that it must be once a week yeah um, that uh that's an interesting observation 
So, you know, my content is generally evergreen. I mean, people are still listening to episodes from the beginning. So, you know, so for me, I think it's more about the quality of the episode than the quantity or the frequency. But everybody has to choose for themselves. I mean, if you're doing one of these, the guys get together and, and, and you know, have fun shows, well, you can do that every week. That's easy. There's not really that much work involved. But if you're doing a show that's got any kind of technical content that requires preparation, right. you know, that's that's the other thing. Also, if you're just doing a simple interview show that doesn't require a lot of prep before you talk to the person, I mean, like some people ask the same questions to every single guest. Right. So that means they don't really need to do much prep. So, you know, there's no one size fits all answer. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a balance of time limitations, the prep needed to be involved, the, the content itself. Um, I think it's a rhythm that the audience is willing to accept. But if you are, that's why I say once you've got, you know, you get mm, 10 episodes, you should have your audience hooked. If you don't have your audience hooked after 10 episodes, more episodes is not going to fix it. <laughs> so you've got your audience hooked. Now they really want your show. Right. Then what they need is to know when it's going to happen so that they don't miss it. And one of the things that's important if you do a monthly show is to have a way of letting them know when the new episode happens. You know, newsletters are great for that. You can set things up so that your show notes go out as a newsletter automatically. And that's that, that's a good way to remind your listeners, hey, I've got a new episode. Because most people's podcasting app is full of so much stuff that they're going to miss it if you're counting on them, you know, looking at their app for the fact that there's a new episode. So that's that's the hazard of once a month is – Oh, maybe they're going to forget. So you do have to have, you know, something in place to help them to remember. And you want to always want to say in your show, I'll be back. Like I put out Brain Science the fourth Friday of every month. And I say that um, I put out Grain Rainbows the first Friday every month. And I say that I'll be back on, you know, you, you want to get in their head. This is when it's going to be right. just like you in the olden days. <laughs> you knew what day and time your favorite TV show came on. I don't think anybody your age can conceive of that idea, but <laughs> but that's what we did, especially since I was alive before the VCR. You know, if you didn't watch it live, you didn't watch it. Right. <laughs> but people still have the ability to remember when you're going to be on if you tell them. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, I'm sure, super helpful for, uh, well, it's very helpful for, for me, who, who I don't think I can do the weekly uh, the weekly schedule. And, and I think it's helpful for anybody who's, who, who wants to try a different kind of schedule. I'd love to, uh, talk more about your interviewing style and how, uh, that's evolved over time. Uh, what is, what is your journey as, as an interviewer been like, uh, and, and how's it changed? How's your, your style changing over time? I really do love that question. I hate people who say that's a great question, but I really do love this question. Um, I didn't actually start out intending to do interviews. And the first one happened by chance. I had posted an episode about a book and it, I was on a website that doesn't exist anymore. And the author saw my post and said something like, well, I hope you like my book or whatever. And it just happened that I said, oh, I think I'll try to see if I can do an interview. And it went really well. And I realized, hey, I could do this. I mean, it's a lot, for me, it's a lot like talking to a patient, okay? Um, and that's the reason why I don't do what a lot of people do, which is that they, a lot of people have all this warm-up involved before they start their interview, and I don't do that. And I think it's because I'm so used to having been an ER doctor just going into the room and talking to the person, right. okay? So I just, the idea that I need to do all this prep just never even entered my mind. Um, so initially, the, the main thing that's changed, I guess, is... Um, I'm more selective about who I interview. Uh, I'm more selective about which books I feature, and that leads to be mean selective about who I interview. Right. I rarely talk to the person ahead of time, but I have been very fortunate to have very few what I would call duds of interviews um, because I pick people who've written books as a general rule, and that indicates a certain level of ability to communicate. Now, even though there's this stereotype that writers are shy, I mostly interview scientists and they're, they don't have much experience with being interviewed, so they need to be guided, but they're, they're usually very generous with their time. Um, I don't know that my style has changed all that much. Uh, going into palliative medicine, 
was very interesting. I did that in 2014. So I'd already been a physician for almost, you know, I'd start medical school. I'd graduated 30 years before. So, I, you know, it's like 30 years out of, me- out of medical school, I went back and did a fellowship. And I had to learn how to interview differently because in palliative medicine, it's all about open-ended questions. In ER, you don't want to ask open-ended questions because you'll never get to what you need to know. Right. In interviewing a scientist, there's a balance between an open-ended question and trying to steer them where you want them to go. And I, I actually think that the most important skill that you can develop as a podcaster when it comes to interviewing, and this is going to sound counterintuitive, is you actually need to know what you're expecting them to say. Hmm. Okay. Now, what I mean is, you should be asking a question because you want to get certain information. That's how you pick your question. What information do you need? Like the way you did it, the questions that you have designed for this interview fit that. You, you want to know about interviewing. Um, so if you ask a person a question that doesn't go anywhere, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay. So depending on the nature of your material, the nature of your show, you may actually know exactly what you expect them to say, especially if you're interviewing an author and you're talking about their book. Right. So you, you need to sort of know where you want the interview to go. And like I said, that's, that's, that's counterintuitive, but that's how you make sure that your interview actually is not just a rambling mess. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and then if you're interviewing a technical person, you need to ha- keep in mind that there's going to be terms that they might use that might need to be defined and be ready to interrupt them when they go off and um, say, well, you know, what does, what does that mean? You know, and, and be okay with that. It, when you're interviewing someone, it is not your job to look smart. Right. Okay. If you try to do an interview, that's like to, to show off how smart you are, a, you're going inter- to, you're going to annoy your listeners and alienate them. And you're going to annoy and alienate your guest. So um, that's, you know, that's, it's okay to ask a question that you know the answer to. Okay. It makes the listener feel like it's okay that they don't know the answer to the question. Okay. You got to put yourself in the position of not you, but the listener. What does a listener need to know to, to understand what your guest is talking about? Right. Okay. Um, and, and that, I think that's, that's the thing that, I think that's really the thing that I do that's really different from most podcasts that I listen to is that I, I really do know as a general rule what I am expecting my guests to say. I actually am sort of steering them, you know, in a very gentle way because I've read, I always read the book first. Okay. I've read the book probably two or three times. I I know what I think are the key ideas. I know what those key ideas are that I want to bring out in the episode. So I know what I'm trying to accomplish if, and anytime you do an interview, you need to know what you're trying to accomplish. Now, if you're doing a, you know, you want to be the next Howard Stern and you want to put your, your guests on the spot and make, you know, and start controversy and all, you're going to design your questions differently, but you still got to know what it is you're trying to accomplish. Right? Right. Yeah. I'd like to ask about the, uh, the, the point you brought up about asking uh, s- seemingly silly questions. That is one thing I, uh, I noticed on the Brain Science podcast. I, you'll ask uh, seemingly earnestly questions that I. My guess is you already know uh, the answer. Uh, like asking something simple about the, I don't know, the structure of of uh, uh, a neuron. Um, when it's clear that you know you 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 know this, but um, you ask for the benefit of of the audience and how how do you decide what level of technicality your your audience is is aware of and what they aren't okay that's that's really a tough one first of all my audience is very diverse so there's no one answer to that question i mean i've literally gotten uh, emails from plumbers and tattoo artists and house painters people that you know no college and I get emails from PhDs who are working neuroscientists. So that makes sure. a yeah. interesting challenge. So I tr- first of all, I try to vary the content from episode to episode. I make some episodes more basic and some episodes are more technical. But what I've learned because, and listener feedback is how you learn this, okay? So you've got to pay attention to your listener feedback. Um, 
my shows evolve mostly based on listener feedback. So for example, I always have an episode summary at the end, and that is based on listener feedback. That I did that, and someone said, yeah, I really like that, and I get consistent. This is the part I really like. So I put a lot of time into the episode summaries because I know that they're important to the listeners. Um, the other thing I've learned from listener feedback is that People don't have to get every single detail if they can get the gist. You know, the biggest problem with, to me, with science uh, coverage in the media is that it's usually too superficial. People act as if people are stupid. And, um, you know, so the coverage is so superficial as to be almost meaningless. And half the time it's wrong. Um, so you have to be willing to accept the fact that that some listeners won't understand every little thing. So when I when I'm picking, what I'm asking is, what things does a person who knows nothing about this, a person who has no science background, what things do they need to know in order to get the big picture? Now I make some assumptions, like I don't in every episode define a neuron and a synapse and you know stuff like that. I mean, you know, that that's to me that's too you know you 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 can if you are interested enough to have turned onto the episode, I think you probably know that stuff. Or we'll find it out by the second time you listen. Um, I want the listeners to be able to get the, the the big picture as opposed to the little bitty details. Right. Yeah. That's a uh, uh, that, that's a challenging uh, balance when you you know you you want to keep the, the the plumber and the neuroscientist both uh, engaged and interested. It's actually not as hard as you would imagine because. Um, if you're a working neuroscientist, you're usually really narrowed down into one particular area. So the feedback I get from the neuroscientists is the reason they listen is because they want to know what guys in other areas are doing. Yeah, so neuroscientists are like most scientists. They, they are, tend to work in very narrow pieces of their field. And so the reason neuroscientists listen to brain science is to hear about what guys are doing outside of their particular subspecialty. So from their standpoint, the big picture is also perfect. Because uh, one of the problems is it's very difficult for specialists to read um, literature outside their narrow field because the language is so specialized. So even working neuroscientists don't have that much access to descriptions of what other guys are doing that are at um, the big picture level. Great. I'd also like to ask about your uh, latest podcast, uh, Graying Rainbows. Uh, so I guess first, maybe you could uh, introduce uh, that one because I, I don't, I don't think we did that at the beginning. Okay. So Graying Rainbows. Um, tagline is coming out LGBT plus later in life. It's a show for people coming out LGBT plus later in life. Of course, the definition of later in life depends on your age. Um, so some of the listeners are not as later in life as I am, but that's okay. And actually the show is, is very, very different from brain science. Um, it has basically three elements. Um, one is LGBT history, which is appropriate for listeners of all ages and, um, um, orientations. Um, the other is to give people access and knowledge of um, resources and to teach them about the issues facing LGBT elders, because a lot of people don't realize that elders are going back into the closet to keep from being discriminated in things like nursing homes. And then the third thing is for people to share their stories so that other people will feel less alone. And the show has really evolved toward an emphasis on the personal stories because that's what I get the feedback from. You remember I told you listener feedback is how your show evolves. And so at the beginning, I had a lot of, um, you know, historians and experts and stuff on the show. And now I mostly have just regular people sharing, sharing their stories because that seems to be the thing that is really resonating with my listeners. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's a very uh, different kind of podcast. Right. And now when I do an interview with somebody who comes on the show, who's agreed to share their story, I don't even have any set questions. I let them talk. I let them share their story. They usually talk about 30 minutes without even being interrupted. And then I may ask them, you know, some questions. Um, I do have one favorite question, which is to ask them, you know, what is your, the biggest surprise on your journey? Because when people are coming out, they have all these expectations about how people will react. And, you know, lots of times things don't go the way they expected. So I like to ask, you know, what was the biggest surprise? So it's very, very different from brain science. I don't know how two shows could be 
any more different than those two shows. Yeah, well, I I would imagine. I mean, that has has probably changed you uh, a, a bit as as a podcaster. I'm based on what you said earlier about um, open ended questions from um, your palliative care work. Uh, I I wonder if there's some. I don't know if there are any kind of connections there, just in how to, um, I guess, draw draw out people's stories during the. Uh, discussion. Yeah, it, it. You would think that that would be the case. I. I can't say that I consciously draw on that. I, I have no idea whether I do it unconsciously. <laughs> <laughs> and from those three different uh, areas, I guess as you were developing the the podcast. How did you, how did you hone in on, um, on the different ones? And I, I, I imagine the the answer is is going to be um, uh, listener feedback, uh, which which is a great uh, learning uh, I'm I'm going to have from this episode. So I guess if if that is the answer, I'm also curious, you know, what what were the ways that you um, got that listener feedback, especially early on, maybe before you had before you hit that ten episode mark. Uh, and didn't have maybe the, the the perfectly clear direction in mind yet. Yeah, I'm trying to think back on what things were like in the early days. I don't remember, you know, like I don't remember like the first email I got or anything like that. Um, I don't have this, I don't have a memory of sitting there going, why isn't anybody writing to me? Although there must have been a period when that was the case. Um, I, I just don't remember it. Um, it. It was funny, early on I would get emails like, I hate your voice or I love your voice and neither one of those is helpful. Right. So you do have to take into account that you're going to get uh, feedback that's not helpful. I have one listener who's been with me from the beginning who every, and he writes me regularly, always critical, but he's still listening. His, the bottom line of his complaint is no episode is technical enough, <laughs> but you know, he's still listening. Um, is that from brain science or for green? Yeah, for brain science. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think what else I've have I changed based on listener feedback. Um, there's things that I do that I might not do if I didn't get listener feedback. For example, I do a yearly review episode, and if I didn't have anybody going, "Hey, I really like that." yearly review episode, I might have quit doing that, you know? So sometimes you're doing something and you get a good feedback and you keep doing it and you don't, you know, you sort of take those for granted. Um, trying to think if there's anything I quit doing. There must be something I quit doing that I can't remember. Um, I think the thing, as far as getting the feedback at the beginning, I mean, you really, really have to say, I want your feedback instead of, you know, what a lot of people do is they try, they put so much emphasis on telling their listeners, you know, to post a review in Apple podcasts. Right. That seems to be everybody's favorite, you know, call to action. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't really help you because you, it, I mean, it just doesn't. So instead of putting your effort into that, if you really want listener feedback, you have to be really clear. And then if you have the right kind of show, I don't do this, but it works on a lot of shows. And that is, you know, you can you can um, take audio. You know, you can use something like SpeakPipe, and then you know, play your listener's audio. Um, that I've heard is a great driver because people like to hear themselves. In fact, I have fallen into that trap for a couple of shows I like. I love to send them audio feedback, knowing that they're going to play it. So I know that's true. Um, so that's if it's that doesn't really fit for the format of brain science and nobody seems to want to do it for grain rainbow so because it's very a privacy issue but um but for a lot of shows that's a really good way to get get your listeners involved especially if you have the kind of show where um especially a fan show you know or or some kind of personal like if you have a show about a certain um problem or anything that that it's going to be shared by your listeners where they can say and this is how i use what you said um, um that's probably the best way to get listeners to do it um 
because you know everybody likes to hear them their themselves on on a show. It's like being on TV. Oh, I'm going to be on TV. You know, um, most people just get really excited by that. I don't know why we do, but we do. Um, but you just really have to tell them, and and don't forget to tell them what your email address is. <laughs> I, I, I I've listened to so many shows where they never say what their email address is. I don't want to have to go find your website and try to figure out what your email address is. Say it. Say it at the beginning. Say it at the end. Right. Make it, make it and and pick something that people will be able to remember too. You know, set up a Gmail account that's named after your show because people will be able to remember that. 